All right, everyone, welcome. Glad that you could be here. Uh, thank you for being here today in person and the uh, many, many people who have joined us online as well. Uh, we are recording, as the, uh, as the, sign, as the sign says. So uh, my name is Kristen Stilt. I'm a professor here and the faculty director of the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program at Harvard Law School, which is over in the, for better, uh, lack of a better name, the Stoked build, Building, <laughs> the building about Stoked. Um, the Animal program, Law and Policy Program is a vibrant community of scholars, instructors, visiting fellows, students, and especially our staff who make everything happen. So thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, everyone who, students who helped make this event happen. Uh, the program includes a clinic, as many of the students know, which runs like a public interest law firm and uh, does super awesome work. I also want a, a special shout out to our new executive director of the program, Nirva Patel, in the very back. So, <laughs> so um, students, feel free to reach out to Nirva too. She's had an incredible career in animal law policy, and this is just uh, the, the next big phase uh, as she works with us to help us build bigger and build and build better. That was not a Biden um, advertisement. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was unscripted. So today's event is uh, also sponsored by the Culture and Animals Foundation and my honor today is to introduce our co-sponsor uh, and then later I'll return here to moderate questions uh, and discussion. Students, we know you have to leave for class at various times so we, we understand we don't take it personally at all. Just try to do it a little bit quietly if you can since we're, we're recording this so that others can watch it afterwards. So it's my pleasure to introduce Martin Rowe, the Executive Director of the Culture and Animals Foundation. And prior to that, he was the co-founder of Lantern Books and Lantern Publishing and Media. And Martin, in turn, will introduce our speaker. Well, uh, thank you, Kristen. Uh, I have uh, just recovered from COVID, but unfortunately it has blocked my ears. So if I speak too loudly or speak too softly, just, just give me some indications of my level. Okay, thank you. So on behalf of myself and the board of the Culture Animals Foundation, let me thank you. Thank you, Kristen, Kelly Reddy, Sarah Pickering, Ella Lynn Anderson, and all the team of the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program for making this lecture possible. And welcome to you, Mirva, uh, in your new position as Executive Director. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge Mia McDonald of Brighter Green, who's in the audience today, uh, for all your hard work on the CAF board for the last eight years and for liaising over several months with Chris Green, lately of this place, and now at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Thank you, Mia, and thank you, Chris. Appreciation also to our board secretary, Rachel Robeson Green, for recommending Cheryl Abate as our Reagan lecturer this year. And grace abounding to our speakers, Cheryl and Dale, for their contributions to animal rights and their engagement with Tom Reagan's legacy. So, as Kristen said, my name is Martin Rowe and I'm CAF's executive director. CAF was founded by Tom and Nancy Reagan in 1985 to support artists and scholars committed to animal rights. This lecture is the sixth that CAF has co-hosted since Tom's death in February 2017 and forms one of our four main programs. Earlier this year, we announced the third Nancy Reagan Arts Prize winner, who is Issa Leshko. We also welcomed our fourth Tom Reagan Research Fellow, Whitney Barlow Robles who spent this summer exploring the ever-expanding animal rights and welfare archives at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. These archives began when Tom Reagan placed his archives and CAF's archives at NCSU, and they now encompass the entire digitized collection of the ASPCA's archives, the HSUS's archives, and many other collections. And I'm happy to say, our second Reagan Fellow, historian of science, Kat Poje, is in the audience today. So if you want to know more about that fellowship, speak to Kat. 
Our best known program is the grants that we've given annually since 2008, but reaching back to the 1980s. And I'm very proud of our record here. In 1988, an independent scholar wrote to Kath asking if he could help, uh, give some money to help her pursue some research for a book she was writing. To her amazement, Kath sent her a check. That author was Carol Adams. The book became The Sexual Politics of Meat and was the first of over 30 titles by this pioneering thinker. In 1992, Kath presented an Activist of the Year Award to an artist for her commitment to animal rights. The artist was astonished. She didn't know her art on behalf of animals could be recognized as activism, let alone honored uh, for it. Sue Ko has spent further three decades producing extraordinary radical art on behalf of the vulnerable and ignored. And last year, Kath awarded Sue Ko the Nancy Reagan Arts Prize. In 2008, a Canadian photographer received a grant to expand her portfolio. That work was We Animals, which grew into the multiple award-winning We Animals Media, now featuring more than 100 extraordinary photojournalists who are rendering the invisible visible. And Joanne is here with us today, uh, taking photographs. And in 2019, an Argentine legal scholar received a grant for her studies, and Silvina Pizzetta is now a visiting fellow at this very institution, and she's here too. So for many of the hundreds of social scientists, literary critics, historians, philosophers, and other scholars, as well as the painters, photographers, filmmakers, sculptors, dramaturges, poets, novelists, dancers, musicians, and others whom we've helped over the years, CAF is often the initiating moment of validation the inflection point for a career in the academy or the arts, and all of it on behalf of non-human animals. Their work, our work, this work must continue. So I hope you'll consider checking out the culture and animals and supporting us as we find the next important place. So before I introduce today's speakers, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that this year is the 40th anniversary of the publication of Tom's magnum opus, The Case for Animal Rights. To celebrate the occasion, Kath commissioned Tony Di Piazza to produce and Jennifer Pickens to read the entire book. And now you too can enjoy 23 hours of analytic <laughs> philosophy <laughs> on 43 different platforms. <laughs> The audiobook contains a new essay by Gary Comstock, Tom's colleague at NCSU, that places Tom within the connective tissue of the body of philosophical thought on animals over half a century, as well as a 2001 reflection by Tom on the writing of the book itself. Thank you to Tony, Jennifer, and Gary. Thank you to Neil Swain and the University of California Press for working to make it happen. And thank you, Karen and Brian Reagan, for deeding your father's royalties to care. Needless to say, information about the audiobook, our programs, and how you can support us can be found at our website, cultureandanimals.org, and to those in the room, we have brochures and uh, a flyer. Now to our speakers. First, Dale Jameson, who will be responding to Cheryl's talk, who makes an appearance in the case for animal rights, and who in 2016 composed I think a touching tribute to friendship and to hospitality, and friendship and hospitality with Tom and Nancy. And you can find that on our website. Dale is Professor Emeritus of Environmental Studies, Director, Center for Environmental and Animal Protection, Affiliated Professor of Law, Medical Ethics, and Bioethics, Founding Director of the Environmental <laughs> Studies Program, and former Chair of the Environmental Studies Department, and Professor of Philosophy, and he led the creation of the Graduate Ant Program in Animal Studies, all at New York University. Dale has held appointments at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, Cornell, Stanford, Oregon, and Arizona State in the United States, Oxford University and King's College London in the UK, and in other countries. 
He is also a former member of the School of Social Sciences at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Among his many books, he is the author of Reason in a Dark Time, Why the Struggle to Stop Climate Change Failed and What It Means for Our Future. And most recently, Discerning Experts, the Practices of Scientific Assessment for Environmental Policy, co-authored with Michael Oppenheimer, Naomi Oreskes, and others. He is also the co-author of Love in the Anthropocene, I'll say it again, Love in the Anthropocene, a collection of short stories and essays written with the novelist Bonnie Nadson, who's also a fellow here and is in the So for our speaker, Cheryl Barton is an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, who specializes in theoretical and applied ethics, especially animal ethics. She created and teaches UL, UNLV's first animal ethics course and has published over 30 academic pieces on the ethical treatment of animals. Her research can be found in leading philosophy journals, including Philosophical Studies, Utilitas, European Journal of Philosophy, Acta Analytica, Ethical Theory and Moral Practice, the Journal of Social Philosophy, Social Epistemology, and Social Theory and Practice. She has published on topics pertaining to animal rights theory, veganism, the epistemology of meat-eating, animal dignity, animal morality, insect sentience, abortion and animal rights, friendship and animals, and the meaning that companion animals bring to our lives, among many other topics. And she named her cat Tom, after oh. Tom. <laughs> That's oh, most <laughs> her most recent publication is as the co-editor of New Omnivorism and Strict Veganism, Critical Perspectives, for which there are flyers right here, which is available for pre-order. And we are delighted and honored to have both distinguished professors here, and thank you again to Harvard Law. So without more ado, to speak on the philosophy of animal rights, a way of life or religion, please welcome to deliver the sixth Tom Reagan Memorial Lecture, Cheryl Abati. His theory of animal rights. So Tom Reagan is famous for applying his theory to the direct exploitation of animals in uh, human explo or exploiting industries, including the meat industry, entertainment industry, hunting industry, and so forth. A lot of my research pursues the question of what does this theory have to say in situations where we're harming animals or interacting with them, but we're not using them as a direct means to human gain. So one example might be. Uh, what does Reagan's theory have to say about the problem of urbanization, right? Animals are being displaced due to urbanization, but when they're harmed as a result of this, it's not due to us using them as a new means, right? It's due to a foreseeable side effect of everyday human activity. Um, so I, I've been uh, a big fan of Tom Reagan uh, throughout my entire career as a philosopher, uh, so much that, yes, I did name my cat after, <laughs> after him. Uh, so I'm very honored to be here, uh, not only to be at Harvard, but also to be here uh, in Tom's name. Um, so this project essentially is to argue that Tom Reagan's theory of animal rights that he defended in the case for animal rights uh, counts as a religion for legal purposes under both uh, Title VII and more controversial, con controversially, um, the constitutional definitions and uh, court definitions as well. Um, just some disclaimers. Uh, so I, throughout this talk, we might consider it as sort of a uh, conditional claim or a claim about consistency that looks something like this. If uh, people who subscribe to traditional religions receive special um, protections under the law, so should those who subscribe to the philosophy of animal rights. So I'm not uh, defending the view that people who are religious receive, should receive uh, special uh, legal protection, nor am I saying this is the right definition of religion. Um, this is just a claim of that uh, consistency. So I just want to clarify that as we get going. OK, so let's get going. Um, so vegans are subject to widespread discrimination and harassment, and laws and policies often prevent them from living in accordance with their deeply and sincerely held moral beliefs. For instance, they have been, so some of what I'm going to put up on the slide refers to actual cases, and some are maybe hypothetical cases, um, fired for refusing to hand out hamburger coupons. This is 
something that actually happened. Fired for refusing to get non-vegan vaccines, also something that has happened. Denied vegan food in prison, subject to workplace harassment and discrimination. They have been targeted by laws that burden only conduct related to vegan activism, uh, such as ag gag laws. Uh, they may not be considered fairly in hiring and school admissions decisions, or even if they are admitted, they might feel left out. Um, they may feel obligated to obey laws that violate their deeply held moral beliefs. So we might imagine a situation where a vegan web designer is asked to create a website for an established religious group that conducts animal sacrifice. Um, and they may be uh, denied public accommodations. I haven't heard about this happening in the US, but I did hear about a case recently, I, I believe it was in Australia, where um, a restaurant uh, posted on their Facebook page, like, no vegans allowed, or vegans aren't welcome. So this very well might happen someday. Okay, so today I'm asking what legal protections, if any, should be available to ethical vegans in these kinds of situations. So discrimination against vegan, vegans is similar to religious discrimination insofar as both are instances of belief-based discrimination. And the beliefs of both religious people and ethical vegans are often so deeply and sincerely held that the believers structure their lives around them. But while religious beliefs and practices enjoy special protection under US law, it remains an open question as to whether and to what extent vegan beliefs and practices should receive similar protections. So some have argued that because the beliefs that underlie ethical veganism allegedly satisfy legal tests of religion, ethical vegans should receive both same legal protections that members of traditionally recognized religions enjoy. Before exploring this thought, I'll first review some of the major protections afforded to religion under the law, some of which might be uh, very common sense to you, but maybe not to some of our listeners online. Um, just so it's clear why someone might want to categorize the beliefs that underlie ethical veganism as religious for vegan purposes. Okay, so first there's the first uh, free exercise clause of the First Amendment. Um, this right, entails that under certain conditions, uh, religious folk might receive religious exemptions from certain kinds of laws. Um, it also allows um, that uh, laws that target specific religions or are hostile to certain re religions uh, may be ruled unconstitutional. Uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits uh, employment discrimination based on religion. It requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations for employees' religious beliefs and practices. It prohibits religious harassment of employees, such as offensive remarks about a person's religious beliefs or practices. Uh, public accommodation laws prevent places of public accommodation from discriminating on the basis of religion. And organizations that receive federal funding must take affirmative action uh, to ensure that applicants are employed and that the employees are treated during employment without, uh, without regard to their religious creed. This is coming from an executive order. Uh, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act establishes free exercise protections for those in government custody. Uh, this act essentially emphasizes that inmates uh, retain certain First Amendment rights. Okay, for, the uh, for Title VII purposes, religious beliefs include, quote, moral or ethical beliefs as to what is right and wrong, which are sincerely held with the strength of traditional religious views, end quote. Uh, the Equal Employment and Opportunity Commission has consistently applied this standard in its decision. In its decisions, excuse me. So one thing to note is that the EEOC has already ruled that the belief in ethical vegetarianism is religious for Title VII purposes. For instance, in 1996, when a vegetarian bus driver named Bruce Anderson was fired after refusing to hand out coupon or, coupons for hamburgers because doing so would violate his belief that animals shouldn't be killed or eaten, the EEOC determined that the bus company failed to accommodate the driver's religious beliefs. And because religion is defined so broadly for the purposes of Title VII, it is unsurprising that the EEOC has determined that beliefs in ethical vegetarianism count as religious. But because less expansive accounts of religion are used in other legal contexts, it's not clear whether the belief in ethical vegetarianism or ethical veganism will always rise to the level of protected beliefs such as for First Amendment purposes. So to see why this might be, uh, we'll now look at some judicial accounts of religion. 
Okay, so in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the Supreme Court adopted a theistic account of religion, uh, but this changed in 1961 when the court acknowledged that not all religions are founded on a belief in the existence of God. Moreover, uh, the Supreme Court has subsequently recognized that, quote, whether a religious belief is true or false is irrelevant to a judicial decision as long as the belief is sincerely held, end quote. And, quote, religious beliefs need not be acceptable, logical, consistent, or comprehensible to others in order to merit First Amendment protection, end quote. Okay, so while these cases essentially tell us what aren't necessary conditions of religion, uh, some have said, well, they still are, they're, they're not very satisfactory because they fail to provide more of a positive account of what religion is. So this problem was somewhat remedied in 1965 when Daniel Seeger sought an objection from the Universal Military Training and Service Act based on, quote, belief in and devotion to goodness and virtue for their own sakes, end quote. Seeger thus professed to have, quote, religious faith and a purely ethical creed, end quote. The court agreed and ruled that a non-theistic belief is religious if it is, quote, sincere and meaningful and occupies a place in the life of its possessor parallel to that filled by the orthodox belief in God of one who clearly qualifies for the exemption, end quote. So instead of focusing on the content of the beliefs in question, the court focused on the function of the beliefs. So on this functional approach, whatever functions as one's ultimate or most serious concern should be protected as an exercise of religion. Okay, in 1970, Elliot Ashton Welch also sought conscientious objection status uh, to the same military act, claiming that his objection was non-religious and purely moral. The court determined that Welch was actually wrong about his own beliefs, and so far as they categorized it as religious, um, uh, but then they ultimately right, ruled in his favor and gave him the exemption. So according to the court, uh, quote, moral, ethical, and religious beliefs about what is right and wrong that are held with the strength of traditional religious convictions, end quote, are religious beliefs. This is because, according to the court, deeply and sincerely held moral beliefs, quote, occupy in the life of that individual a place parallel to that filled by God in traditionally religious persons, uh, end quote. Uh, one problem, though, with the Seeger and Welsh rulings is that they still don't provide a clear method for determining whether belief functions as a religion in an individual's life. So essentially, the distinctive marks of established religions need to be uh, identified before we can ask whether some new set of beliefs serves the same purpose or function as these traditionally established religions. And because the Supreme Court has failed to, or at this point, have failed to offer a clear method for distinguishing between religious and non-religious beliefs, some of the circuit courts then devise their own religious inclusion tests, and these tests are widely used. Okay, so for example, the widely used Adams test was introduced um, in 1979. According to this test, there are three, quote, useful indicia that are basic to our traditional religions, and well, that is the nature of the ideas in question, comprehensiveness, and formal signs. And then the Myers factor was created in 1995. According to this test, there are five factors that the court have used, that the court used to determine whether a set of beliefs is religious for First Amendment purposes. That includes ultimate ideas, uh, metaphysical beliefs, moral or ethical system, comprehensiveness of beliefs, and accoutrements of religion. Uh, so there's some overlap between these tests, but uh, the Myers includes a little bit more. Um, and according to the Myers court, if a set of beliefs satisfies all of these factors, we can be confident that it is a religion for First Amendment purposes. Okay. So one legal context that relied on the Adams test um, ruled that veganism is not a religious creed. So in this case, uh, Gerald Friedman refused on moral grounds to get the mumps vaccine, which is grown in chicken embryos. And getting this vaccine was a condition of his employment. So after his employment offer was rescinded, he, instead of filing a Title VII suit in federal court, he filed a complaint in California state court for religious free discrimination 
under California's Fair Employment and Housing Act. And this act uses a less expansive account of religion than that is used in Title VII contexts. Um, so this case made it to the, uh, an appeals court in California, and the court ultimately ruled that ethical veganism isn't a religious creed because it fails the Adams test. Namely, the court claimed that ethical veganism is an isolated teaching, doesn't concern ultimate questions, and that no external or formal signs are present alongside it. So some of the court's remarks, I think, are very plausible. Uh, so for instance, ethical veganism tells us what we shouldn't do regarding animals and animal product use. It doesn't tell us what to do in other kinds of contexts. For instance, it doesn't tell us if it's wrong to lie, to cheat, to steal, so on and so forth. So it does seem to be an isolated, isolated teaching that concerns, quote, the single subject of highly valuing animal life, end quote. So I agree that ethical veganism probably shouldn't be recognized as a religious creed for legal, most legal contexts outside of uh, Title VII, especially given uh, the circuit court's uh, uh, definition, uh, definitions of religion, or accounts of religion, we might say. Um, however, I will argue that there is a different set of beliefs that underlies ethical veganism that does qualify as religious according to even the most demanding religious inclusion tests used in modern law. And I'm, uh, assuming that that's the Myers test. So I will refer to the set of beliefs as the philosophy of animal rights, which is found within uh, the case for animal rights. Uh, so on my view, if ethical veganism is practiced out of respect for the philosophy of animal rights, then it should be considered a religious practice under the law. But it will always be considered a religious practice, right? If people I believe in ethical veganism for other kinds of reasons. Okay, so my argument uh, here it is. Uh, it essentially is to say if a set of beliefs satisfies the Myers inclusion test, then it is religion, religious for all legal purposes, including First Amendment purposes. Uh, and then I'm going to argue that the philosophy of animal rights does in fact satisfy the Myers inclusion test, so then we can be confident that it is a religion for all legal purposes. And I'm focusing on the Myers factors because it seems to be me to be the most demanding uh, religious inclusion test. It, for instance, uh, for instance, encompasses the indicia used by other religious inclusion tests, such as the Adams test, while also adding additional ones. Okay, so what is the philosophy of animal rights? The philosophy of animal rights is a moral theory defended by Tom Reagan in the case for animal rights. It seeks to answer this question. What is the ultimate goal of morality? And it answers, to treat and view humans and animals with respect. So in doing so, it provides an ultimate or fundamental moral principle from which we can derive all of our moral principles and all of our moral duties. And that is the respect principle, which says treat and view humans and animals in ways that respect their inherent value. Uh, the philosophy of animal rights describes the basic rights of individuals. Namely, it says humans and animals have a fundamental moral right to be viewed and treated in ways that respect their inherent value. And it describes the basic duties of moral agents. Don't treat or view humans or animals as mere means for your own personal gain or to increase social utility, but do treat and view humans and animals as ends in themselves. Moreover, it provides a criterion of right and wrong action. Right acts are those that treat and view humans and animals with respect, and wrong acts are those that fail to view or treat humans or animals with respect. Okay, um, this is the basic argument that Tom Reagan gives for the claim that uh, animals have moral rights, um, and including the right to be treated with respect, it is essentially an extension of human rights theory to uh, animal rights. So it starts with the basic intuition that all humans have inherent value and thus the right to be treated with respect. Then it asks what grounds that inherent value. It's not rationality, it's not capacity for intellectual thought, ability to do math or poetry. Uh, it's not the capacity for moral agency. Why? Because there are many humans uh, that lack those capacities. Namely, for instance, babies or those with severe mental disabilities. So the claim is what grounds the inherent value of, hu of humans, all humans, is the fact that they are experiencing special life. That is what all humans have in common. That makes it the case that they are so morally special that they have this inherent value. Um, but many animals have 
are, are, are experiencing subjects of Elijah as well. So the thought is, well, moral consistency demands that we extend the logic of human rights to animal rights. Okay, now that we have this basic understanding, hopefully, <laughs> of the philosophy of animal rights, I am going to now demonstrate that it uh, is part of a religious creed that satisfies uh, the Myers conditions. Okay, so let's start with the first condition of ultimate beliefs. So the philosophy of animal rights proclaims that our value as humans isn't reducible to the intrinsic value of our experiences or our utility to others. Uh, because we have inherent value, we have value if our lives are unhappy and depressing, and even if we don't contribute anything at all to society. And this is essentially to say that a human life is valuable even if the one living it is a hermit, a drain on society, doesn't want to continue living, and so forth. Uh, so this view shares much in common with the Judeo-Christian sanctity of human life doctrine. And the philosophy of animal rights includes animals in the sanctity of life perspective, insisting that animals, in virtue of being experiencing subjects of a life, also have inherent value. And this helps us make sense of the place of both humans and animals in the universe. While humans and animals have a special kind of value, inanimate objects have mere instrumental value. Humans and animals in their lives are thus special. And while the philosophy of animal rights claims that human beings and animals themselves are equally valuable, it claims that the lives of rational humans tend to have more value than the lives of <coughs> animals simply because rational humans tend to have greater opportunities for satisfaction. So it holds that some higher opportunities for satisfaction, for satisfaction are available only to human animals, such as the satisfaction from thinking abstractly about morality, that satisfaction that you're getting right now, right, your dog, that is unavailable to your dog. Uh, so this all indicates that there's a kind of natural order in the universe and that the lives of rational humans tend to be at the top. And I'm talking specifically about lives. Okay. The philosophy of animal rights thus answers a number of ultimate questions related to human life. Are humans and human lives valuable? To what degree? How does the value of humans in their lives compare to the value of other creatures and things in their respective lives? Moving on. Um, throughout the case, Reagan is clear that the purpose of creatures with inherent value is not to serve as mere means for others. Rather, the purpose of humans and animals is to seek their species' normal ends and interests, i.e. to exercise their species' normal capacities in pursuit of species' normal interests and live their lives with limited interference from others. Because rational humans have higher capacities, such as cognitive, aesthetic, moral, and spiritual capacities, the philosophy of animal rights entails that our purpose is related to these capacities. For instance, because we have the capacity to derive satisfaction from applying abstract moral principles to moral decision making, one purpose of rational humans is to abide by morality's demands. And because, as we'll see, one such demand is to assist uh, victims of injustice, one of our purposes is to help victims of injustice. So the philosophy of animal rights answers a number of ultimate questions related to human purpose. Why should we get out of bed in the morning, especially when we're feeling hopeless and in despair? Well, the answer, there are victims of injustice who need and deserve our help. Why am I here? We're here to experience this world with our rational capacities and enjoy highly valuable satisfactions as a result. We're here to be good moral agents. We're here to help others. And we're here to build respectful relationships with other creatures with inherent value. The philosophy of animal rights thus provides its followers with a sense of existential relief in knowing that there is more to human life than shopping, watching football, getting drunk in bars, uh, and so forth. <laughs> So yay, okay. <laughs> uh, all right, the philosophy of animal rights uh, states that humans and animals are harmed by death when death thwarts a preference to go on living or death deprives them of future opportunities for satisfaction. This explains why animals and humans are normally harmed by untimely deaths, even when these deaths are painless. And it emphasizes that the harm of death is the ultimate harm because it permanently forecloses opportunities for satisfaction. It also explains why death isn't always a harm, such as when the one who dies would face immense and unrelenting suffering if they were to go on living. 
This then can help us to come to terms with decisions involving terminally, the terminally ill, whether it be a terminally ill animal that we might be questioning, ought we to euthanize the animal, or a terminally ill family member who ends her own life through physician-assisted death. So the philosophy of animal rights answers the following ultimate questions about <coughs> death. Are humans and animals harmed by death? If so, why? Um, is it ever permissible to kill humans or animals? It is it ever permissible to end your own life? Moving on to uh, the second Myers factor, uh, metaphysical beliefs. So the philosophy of animal rights includes metaphysical beliefs insofar as it acknowledges while there is a physical and apparent world, we might call the natural, natural world, in which uh, animals are viewed and treated like mere resources, there is also a moral reality which we can discover through reason. And this moral reality transcends the physical world. The philosophy of animal rights, like natural law uh, theory, which is appropriated by Catholicism, assumes that morality is real and it isn't a mere human construction. Moral truths, which are essentially abstract entities, they exist regardless of what any one person, culture, or legal system believes, and they are not reducible to natural facts. Uh, so this is a robust moral realist account of morality that Regan is presenting us with. So this moral reality includes unobservable and merely alleged phenomena such as rightness, wrongness, moral rights, inherent value, moral duties, respect, and justice that can't be proven or verified by the scientific method. You can't bring a cat into a lab, put the cat under a microscope, and see that it has inherent value, right? Um, okay, moving on to the third Myers factor. I think it's very obvious. <laughs> Here that the philosophy of animal rights is going to satisfy this factor, uh, go above and beyond, right? So they use normative terms such as wrong and unjust, they prescribe acts that are wrong, they enumerate duties what, that we must follow, even when doing so would thwart our self-interest. So we'll move on from that one. Okay, comprehensiveness of beliefs. The philosophy of animal rights is a set of comprehensive beliefs. There is one fundamental moral principle that he, which says humans and animals should be treated with respect, and from this principle, we can derive uh, the answers to most moral problems that humans uh, face and confront. So we have right, this fundamental moral principle at the top, the respect principle. From this principle, we can derive the harm principle, which essentially, essentially says don't harm others. The assistance principle, which says assist those who are treated unjustly. And the worst off and the mini right principles are principles to, that are used in what Reagan calls forced choice or life coat scenarios. Uh, from the harm principle, right, we can figure out in what ways can you know, humans and animals be harmed. They are harmed by death when they are confined and when they are hurt, either physically or mentally. So this entails that we have prima facie duties not to kill, not to confine, and uh, not to hurt, either physically or mentally, humans or animals. And then there are also beneficence-based duties to assist any animal or human uh, in need of help, uh, even those that face um, harm due to natural events, but it's not a justice-based duty. And the justice-based duties in green are always going to take, well, most in most cases, will take priority over beneficence-based duties because justice duties concern what others can actually claim of us, what we owe to other creatures. Okay, um, from this ethical system, we can uh, answer most problems we're confronted with. Is it wrong to kill animals for food, especially when plant-based options are available? Yes, because doing so would be to treat them like mere resources. Is it wrong to go to a circus that uses animals? <coughs> yes, because doing so would be to view them as mere resources. Is it wrong to kill Sally, the human, and harvest her organs? Yes, <laughs> doing so right would harm her and uh, treat her like mere resources. Is it wrong to steal da I thought you'd be sitting here. Uh, to steal Dale's computer uh, and sell it and donate the profits to charity? Yes, because right, Dale would be harmed by that, and there would be a sense in which we're using Dale as a means, uh, a mere means. Um, who should I rescue in a burning building situation, the mouse or the human? Uh, the worst off principle tells us to rescue the human, or rational human, uh, because the human would be made worse off by death uh, as opposed to the mouse. Okay, last Myers factor, accoutrements of religion. Uh, so the Myers factor um, lists 10 external finds that are often present alongside the philosophy of animal rights. I'm going to show that they're also present in, um, er, er, the, in, within the philosophy of animal rights. Okay, so the first sign is there being, for instance, a teacher. So there is a clear teacher. <laughs> the, um, 
Right. Uh, there's a clear founder of the philosophy of animal rights, that is Tom Reagan, that's why we're all here today. He is certainly deemed enlightened and gifted insofar as he defended the rights of animals at a time and in a culture that normalizes the exploitation of them and belittles and even threatens those who dare to challenge the status quo. All right. uh, Reagan's seminal book, The Case for Animal Rights, is the most important writing on animal rights and leaflets Summarizing this text are often distributed. I don't know if they're over there, but I got one <laughs> at the first Tom Reagan Memorial Lecture. Um, Reagan's books about animal rights include anti-speciesist tenets um, and respect tenets, and they in some sense include commandments, such as don't use animals for agricultural purposes, don't harm animals for research or education, don't hunt or track animals. These are topics he specifically and directly addresses but respect animals, assist victims of injustice. Uh, there are many gathering places that are considered important for adherence of the philosophy of animal rights, uh, such as VegFest, which was created back in 1985. Uh, and this is an annual festival that occurs throughout the US and usually involves food, speakers, entertainment, cooking demos, and a kid zone, so it's very community uh, building in that sense. Vegan farm sanctuaries are common gathering places for those who practice animal rights. Many offer opportunities to volunteer and connect with the animals, but also opportunities to connect with like-minded persons. For instance, uh, many sanctuaries host uh, vegan potlucks, reading groups, reading group events that are hosted regularly. Um, and um, the, these vegan gathering places are, in a sense, considered sacred insofar as animal product normally isn't allowed on the property. Um, some of these gathering places are so well known that people travel all around the world to visit them, such as Farm Sanctuary and Woodstock. Um, there is an Animal Rights National Conference established in 1981, which brings uh, people who are bonded and their commitment to animal rights together. The conference boasts of 100 speakers, uh, 80 plus panels, and plenty of educational opportunities. So there's a sense in which there are these keepers of knowledge, these enlightened folks um, who are there to essentially share their knowledge about animal rights uh, with the general public at this conference. So this is not an academic conference, actually, but a large majority, or large number of the people who attend have no formal training in academia. They're not affiliated with animal rights organizations. They're just, you might say, like, uh, general members of the public who uh, want to learn more about animal rights and how to better protect animals. Uh, those who adhere to the philosophy of animal rights often participate in uh, cer uh, ceremonies and rituals in some sense, such as animal save events. So these animal save events are essentially vigils at slaughterhouses where participants bear witness to animals uh, as they are sent off to slaughter. Um, there's a, a ritualistic aspect uh, to these animal save events, so one that I've participated in in Las Vegas, the participants uh, would bring flowers and put them on the fences of the slaughterhouses or the slaughterhouse truck trucks, and then afterwards uh, participants would gather together and share their experiences. <coughs> uh, so these witness events aren't exactly protests, uh, they can be combined with protests. Um, and another thing to note is that these are usually regularly scheduled like the first uh, Saturday of the month, and that might matter for uh, religious purposes. Okay, there's uh, now a National Animal Rights Day established in 2011, and in this year it was commemorated in 150 <coughs> cities worldwide. There's also an International Animal Rights Day that was established in 1998. On this day, animal rights supporters from around the world hold candlelight vigils and events that celebrate the animal rights movement. Flushing animal rights obviously <laughs> prohibits the consumption of animal flesh and product, and some sub-communities encourage members to avoid even plant-based foods that are known to be especially harmful to free living animals, such as unsustainable palm oil. The philosophy of animal rights prescribes the type of clothing that adherents wear, namely vegan clothes. <laughs> Some communities uh, interpret the philosophy of animal rights as <coughs> prohibiting the wearing of even faux uh, animal clothing, like faux leather, uh, because it perpetuates the, it may, might perpetuate the idea that animals are uh, here to be clothing. <coughs> Relatedly, uh, some communities encourage members to take what's called the Animal Liberation Pledge. This is essentially a pledge that says, I will not sit down at a table where there is animal flesh or even animal product. 
And people who take this pledge often wear the sport bracelet to symbolize that they've taken the pledge. Uh, many animal rights adherents also have distinctive vegan tattoos, such as this uh, green V that's very common, right? You see this, you, you know, and someone has it, you have good reason to suspect that they're vegan. Uh, uh, many people have the tattoo or wear earrings with the number 269, which is significant for uh, the animal rights movement. It refers to a tag number of a calf who was rescued right before slaughter. Now, although these tattoos uh, and wearing fork bracelets aren't required in animal rights communities, they're still becoming more and more common, and they're easy way, ways of identifying uh, fellow animal rights adherents. Um, and then finally, adherents of the philosophy of animal rights certainly believe that they have something worthwhile or essential to offer non-believers, and they attempt to propagate their views and persuade others of their correctness. This is clear given the pervasiveness of direct action everywhere, disruption events, and anonymous for the voiceless cube of truth events. Uh, while some communities prioritize the participation in very organized protests where there is, um, where they're in, where they're sort of led or supervised by the head of the organization, uh, other people who are part of the animal rights community might practice more informal <coughs> outreach events such as those who set up informational events about uh, or tables concerning veganism in parks and on college campuses. All right, uh, wrapping up. Uh, Reagan himself remarked that, quote, the animal rights, that animal rights is more than a philosophical idea. It is also part of the animal rights movement, end quote. And what sets the philosophy of animal rights apart from other secular uh, moral theories like utilitarianism and Kantianism is the fact that formal and external signs are present alongside it. Essentially, because those who adhere to the philosophy of animal rights are so strongly and sincerely committed to the tenets of the theory, they have turned it into a religion by, for instance, establishing a National Animal Rights Day, a National Animal Rights Conference, veg fest, direct <coughs> action initiatives, and so forth. And the fact that external and formal signs accompany the philosophy of animal rights, but not other <laughs> ethical theories, indicates that adherents of the philosophy of animal rights, but not followers of other ethical theories, hold their moral beliefs with the strength of religious conviction. And the implications for law are clear. Those who sincerely adhere to the philosophy of animal rights should enjoy the same legal protections that individuals who adhere to established religions enjoy under Title VII, the First Amendment, and any other legal context. All right, thank you so much. Do I need to do this? Okay. Yes. Um, so, thank you, Cheryl. So, I, I just want to begin by saying that, that Tom Reagan really maintained a lifelong interest in religion at a time when it was particularly unfashionable in, in, in academia. And there were at least two reasons for that. One reason is that he really did find religious and religious teachings and traditions uh, a source of knowledge and inspiration. And, and in fact, I don't think that Tom ever probably would have become a publishing philosopher had it not been with his confrontation with, with, with Gandhi. Uh, during the Vietnam War, he turned to the writings of, of Gandhi, and he discovered, among other things, Gandhi's vegetarianism. And this is really what set Tom off on the road to animal rights. In fact, the first paper that he published on animal rights was called The Moral Case of Vegetarianism which was the title of a book of, of Gandhi. So, so religion and religious traditions had an important role to play in Tom's own life. But then Tom also saw religion as uh, a significant motor of social change. As we would say these days, it was part of his theory of social change. Whether or not that's true is really going to be one of the questions that I at least, uh, that I at least want to put on the table. Um, but, Cheryl's talk is very much uh, in the spirit of 
Tom's work, and I, uh, it's one of those talks that I regret that he's not here to see this, because I, I think he would find much to approve of in the talk, and also greatly appreciate the depth of Cheryl's engagement with his work. So, um, it, here's what I'm going to do in these remarks. I would say brief remarks, but those are always the most chilling words in the English language when spoken <laughs> by an academic. Um, <laughs> I'm not an expert in constitutional law or civil rights law or really any area of law, but that doesn't keep me from having opinions. <laughs> so I will make some framing comments about at least how I see this, this area of law at the beginning. But then I'm going to go on and really ask two questions, and these are the questions that I think are most, would be most important for our discussion. So, uh, so the first question is really about how we should think about this increasing reach of religion into the public sphere. Is it good for the United States? And is it something that the animal rights movement should take, an take the opportunity with respect to, should be complicit in, should, should contribute to? How do we actually think about that? Cheryl wanted quite reasonably in her talk bracketed that question, but I think as a topic of discussion, it's an important thing to, to discuss. And then secondly, I think we can ask the question, is the religiousification of animal rights actually good for animals? So that's the second question I want to raise. So first, then, by way of uh, a framing comments. Now, as Cheryl points out, religious practice and law interact in really many different ways and actually many different areas of the law. Uh, and it's, it's not so easy, actually, to make all of these consistent coherent or intellectually satisfying. And all of this is happening at the same time that there's a real transition underway uh, with uh, the sort of, re with religious claims having more weight in the, public, in the public sphere. Now, what I'm going to talk about in my framing comment uh, is really about the free exercise clause of the First Amendment, which I think is most basic. And in fact, what I have to say about that, I think, actually probably does apply to the intersection of religion and law in other places as well. Now, so most of the Bill of Rights, not all of the Bill of Rights, but most of the Bill of Rights, but especially the First Amendment, is fundamentally about liberty. It's about the liberty of people. And the free exercise clause, at least as I think it's best understood, and there's a lot of scholarship that understands it this way and a lot of scholarship that doesn't, but I think the free enterprise clause, the free enterprise clause, <laughs> the free exercise clause is best understood about the liberty of citizens to freely exercise religion. That is, it's not about protecting religion, it's not even about tolerating religion. And indeed, it's not even, I would say, fundamentally about religion at all. It's about the free exercise of religion as in terms of what that means to individuals in relation to society. So religion, or a religion, comes into play because it's implicated in an individual's exercising religious liberty. But the, but the core notion here is that of religious liberty. And at least since the, the Reynolds case in 1878, it's been clear that what's really at issue uh, for the law are the actions or practices that flow from religion that can come into conflict with duties and other legal requirements. The, the liberty to believe whatever we want is not really in question, at least since Reynolds. So, so when we recognize then that, that it's individual liberty that's really at stake in the free exercise clause, and we bring this together with our common law tradition, it's not surprising then that we have no list of recognized religions or any really systematic attempts by the courts to really define religion, because that would actually be quite secondary, since the focus is on liberty. So the challenge then that the courts face in deciding cases is to know it when they see it, right? Because their focus is on an individual case and an individual claim. 
And so what the courts need to do is to determine, in a particular case, whether a behavior or practice flows from a commitment or, or belief system that is, to quote from one of the decisions that Cheryl mentioned, is, filled, is, is a belief system that's, quote, filled by God in, tr in a traditionally religious person. So, so this is one of the important takeaways here. It's perfectly consistent for a court to grant one Catholic or one vegan, for that matter, an exemption, but not another Catholic or vegan. Because the exemption is not about the religion. It's about the exercise of religion on the part of the individual. Yet, so, so, so that's what I think is true. And that's how I think we should really understand the free exercise clause. Now the complications begin. Having said this, we generalize from cases, as we must and should, but from this we often move to what I think is the error of putting religion and religions at the center of these decisions rather than religious liberty. So there's a temptation then to ask whether a particular religion or philosophy satisfies some set of conditions for an exemption rather than asking whether an individual's actions that flow from an embrace of a religion or philosophy satisfies the conditions for exemption. And once the question is moved away from individual liberty to philosophical systems or religions, things get political very quickly. And um, I, I'm going to tell you a story from my own life where I think, uh, where my life intersects with, some, with religious exemptions in a, in a way that I think becomes political very quickly. So, so in 1965, I obeyed the Selective Service Act in registering for the draft. But I refused to accept any classification from the Selective Service System that was not, as it was called in those days, 1-0, which was the conscientious of objection classification. Um, I, um, I made my case on the grounds that I was part of a religious tradition that was a religious tradition like most Christian traditions, has, has a just war doctrine, and that the war in Vietnam failed the just war doctrine, was an unjust and immoral war, and therefore a person in that religious tradition should refuse to fight in it. And I also made the case on purely rational, non-religious grounds as well. So I was turned down, and I continued to be turned down at every level of appeal for five years. Uh, and the, the stated reason was that I was not a member of a pacifist religion, and nor did I present a rational case for absolute pacifism. That, was because I wasn't an absolute pacifist. So after five years of the threat of prosecution hanging over my head and the head of many other people at that time who had similar views that I did, I, along with many others, mysteriously got our conscientious objection classifications after the 1970 Wells decision, which Cheryl refers to, and, which as Cheryl points out, is essentially an ethics is a religion case. That's what's being inserted in Welsh. But it isn't a selective conscientious objection case. And in fact, in 1971, the Supreme Court ruled really definitively that selective conscientious objection was, was not a ground for being classified as a conscientious objection. So what, in effect, they did is it what the Selective Service System did administratively interpreting these, court, interpreting these court decisions is they interpreted me as, and many others as having made a sincere, rational, and therefore religious case for absolute pacifism. That's how they read my documents. So they did the right thing, quote unquote, without acknowledging that selective conscientious objection is really deeply rooted in the just war tradition of many religions. So in effect, they were giving a religious exemption by systematically misunderstanding what a religious exemption should have been in this particular context. So we have to ask the question, are people disconfused? Or what, what's really going on here? What changed between 1965 and 1970? 
And what changed is that views that in 1965 had seemed almost treasonous to many people had now become almost conventional. And the administrative system was working to reflect that change in view. The war in Vietnam was winding down. In 1973, the draft was abolished. And Carter pardoned draft resistors in 1977. So all of that that happened to people like me in 1970 was the beginning of that winding down of Vietnam War actions. So, um, so you know, in a way, this is almost making the boring point. It's the politics that matter here, much more than trying to make sense out of a whole bunch of very complicated and conflicting court cases. And this really leads me then to my first question. Do we want the animal protection movement to try to exploit this trend of greater respect for religious claims that we're experiencing at the moment, even when it risks creating precedents that we may not like. What's the relationship here between opportunism, complicity, uh, and contribution? So Cheryl discovered, uh, discusses the 1995 Myers factors. I mean, that's a bit, the Myers case is a really interesting case. In itself. It, was about, it was about the founder of the Church of Marijuana who was trying, who was trying to beat a rap. And, um, uh, now, now, Cheryl argues, I think, quite convincingly that the philosophy of animal rights does well on most of the science uh, of the Myers factors. But I think probably you know, somebody could give a talk about the Swifties and how they <laughs> probably do pretty well on the Myers factors as well. Um, but what I think is a little more scary is I, I think the Church of MAGA here probably has at least as strong a claim as the philosophy of animal rights with its prophet, who in fact is also being crucified. Uh, there are the important writings in the form of tweets. Um, the, gather, the gathering places called rallies, the ceremonials and ceremonies and rituals and chants, lock her up, uh, the appearances and clothing, red hats, um, ultimate meaning, make America great again, uh, the ethic, don't be a loser. I mean, <laughs> it, I mean um, it looks to me like uh, we've made the transition here to something that looks scarily like a religion along with whatever accommodations and exemptions go with other religions. And I think this is particularly dangerous in the American context, again, because of another court decision that Cheryl quoted, because we have a content-free notion now of what constitutes religion. We don't, religious beliefs need not be, quoting the court, logical, consistent, or comprehensible. Okay. Question two. Is it good for the animal protection movement to identify as a religious movement? Now, here I'll, I'll, I'll be brief, but I think it's a really important question. So religion, as a matter of fact, is often, by many people, to be seen as exclusionary. Religion is also often seen as being non-rational or even irrational, even when it has some rational basis. This association uh, is, I think, a barrier to entry to many people who otherwise are supportive of animal protection causes. And I think this is especially unfortunate, to, that is to erect another barrier to entry, when vast amounts of animal suffering could be eliminated through behavioral change and policy change that's simply based on broadly shared notions of rational self-interest. Animal agriculture produces climate change, environmental disaster, health problems, and so on. And you don't have to be anywhere near a religious commitment to animal rights to sign up for those kinds of causes. So, the, so, so what I really want to do then is really just put two questions on the, on, the, on the table here. And the first question is, how far does the animal rights movement want to go in the direction of this expansion of the authority of religious claims in the public sphere? Is that something people should worry about? And secondly, is it a good look for the animal rights movement to, so to speak, volunteer to see itself as a religion when, in fact, so many people already see it as a religion? 
Thank you very much, Cheryl and Dale. We have about uh, 17 minutes, plus or minus, for questions, comments, concerns. Ella's going to give us any that come in through the chat. Anyone, if you have already, or is there someone in this, someone here who wants to, uh, to start, or should we go right to the right to the chat? And do we need to share the microphone? Are you the microphone yes. there, Shashank? That's awesome. It's right there. Why don't we let Yi uh, ask a question, and we'll we'll go to right back here, and then we'll go to um, to our online participants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is very uh, inspirational. I really echo a lot of what Dale has said because coming from China, I'm a recent fellow at the program. Coming from China, being we spent all these years trying to get away from Buddhism. You know, mm -hmm. like in China, we have this uh, terrific historic uh, leg legacy of Buddhism that you know, supports holy uh, practice diet. But then, at the same time, it's a very huge, heavy uh, historic baggage that we have carried. So we have spent all these years trying to get away from religion, that they have has a very right way of going out. And also, if we think Tom Reagan is American, and we, if we hear we're claiming uh, immorality as a religion coming from the West, What's the social implications for people in the global south? Right? If we try to promote uh, veganism there and that is only there. Yeah. Okay, great. I, so I think maybe this relates to your question of is it bad for the animal rights movement to be characterized as religious? Uh, it might, maybe it might be, as you mentioned, like a barrier to entering the animal rights movement. So um, I don't think that the animal rights movement, I'm not suggesting this or uh, advocating this, that it needs to be characterized as religious and non-legal discourse. So I don't think like animal rights activists should go around claiming like my beliefs are religious to, like, to the general public when they're doing activism or so forth. My, my point is more like uh, this can be used as a legal defense in court cases. And I think that this is especially important when it comes to laws that specifically target uh, animal rights activism, activism like ag gag laws because they're <laughs> There's a lot to lose um, if these laws are enforced, right? So this is another, I think, compelling uh, legal defense that maybe they might try out in courts uh, in states that have these ad gag laws. Um, um, another thing to note too is even if you know, so so one thing to note is um, the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, right? They've already determined, as I mentioned, that. Uh, veganism is a religion for Title VII purposes, and I, this doesn't seem like it has damaged <laughs> the reputation of the animal rights movement. So if uh, the animal rights movement is uh, ca categorized as a religion for First Amendment purposes, I also don't see that as being a barrier to entry to the movement. Um, it might be like, okay, this is a legal defense we can use in the court system, and that hopefully maybe might be uh, like where the converse, where this ca categorization of animal rights as religion stays, um, and that won't be used right to when animal rights activists are conducting activism. Um, and, and one thing I was thinking about too, in response to Dale's question, is even if uh, the animal rights movement starts being widely categorized as religion, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Because one thing I was thinking about is that it's often dismissed as like bad or a mere personal preference. So characterizing it as a religion actually might reveal that there's something sort of deep behind behind the animal rights movement that um, the beliefs are sincerely held. This isn't just a mere sort of personal preference or uh, a fad. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, but I will end, go ahead and end there. I don't know if you want to add on, Dale. Um, yes, Ella, please give us a question from the uh, online community. I also have my own personal question, but I will Q&A. All right, you, you, give, give us one of those first, and then we'll come back to you. Okay, um, so, uh, the, we, we, yeah. Yeah, so the first question is, does defining veganism as a creed, as a creed soul, the wording is a bit off, as a creed, solve the dilemma that an adherent to a religion can self-identify as a vegan without compromising their faith? 
Do you want me to repeat? Yeah, yes, please. Does defining veganism as a creed solve the dilemma that an adherent to a religion can self-identify as a vegan without compromising their faith? Right, so someone who's, who's, who's Jewish or Hindu or Muslim, could they also be, could they have, could have two religions uh, in the sense of, this is my question as well, in, the, in, in, in your sense? That's really not so much the legal question, although it, it could be. Um, you can also argue that, you're, that Judaism requires veganism. Right? And if we're not going to look at the content of religion, you might get your vegan meals in prison as well. But I think the question is, do we have a problem of two religions? No, but no, you could also do a challenge to sincerity. Right. So what I'm, I'm, I'm a vegan now, but I was a Jew yesterday before I was arrested. <laughs> <laughs> right, so one thing that is uh, sort of distinctive about religion, at least according to the Myers factor, is that uh, religions are action guiding. Um, they tell us right, what we morally ought to do, uh, what we ought not to do. So I would think, right, someone who's really committed to religion, uh, to a particular re religion, would be using that belief system to determine what they ought to do and what not, what they ought not to do. And then they might come to see that their religion maybe implies or entails um, a commitment to veganism, even if that's not sort of the dominant thought within their religion. So this is something that has come up quite a bit in a, at least Christianity, for example, right? Um, most Christians don't exercise a vegan diet, but uh, many people have come to see that, or to, to believe that uh, Christianity, in fact, does require like stewardship of the earth and not, um, despot or, like, um, right, not not exploiting the natural world. We might say, um, but I, I would think, right, that it would be I don't know intuitively weird to have two religions just because they are religions are action guiding. <laughs> um, so you, you would think like. Uh, it would be weird to have two conflicting uh, systems that are uh, two, two conflicting kinds of religion that religions that are getting different moral principles, essentially. Um, it, it seems to me, I'll just interject very quickly, that your, uh, your argument provides an argument that might be helpful, convenient, uh, necessary to some people at some times, and it may not be needed by other people at other times. Uh, there, an activist who I know uh, in prison, when he was in prison, said my form of Catholicism requires a vegan diet, right? And, and he got it. That may not work if in some of your other kinds of cases where uh, perhaps the situation is a little more formal or, or tense and requires more legal, legal intervention or legal defense, let's say, that might not be a, a good enough answer. Yeah, and I was looking at some of the cases that involved legal or sorry, requests for vegan food in prison, and most of the requests made the case like either they were Buddhists, and then that required a vegan diet, or um, various kind of forms of Christianity. Um, and there was one case, I believe, in St. Louis, where someone requested a vegan diet for the sake of morality, uh, but he, he essentially espoused a belief in just ethical veganism itself, and not the false of animal rights, and he was actually denied. Uh, um, a vegan diet. Um, so this is an issue right now in prisons. If you don't subscribe to like a traditionally established religion, and then you're requesting a vegan diet for ethical reasons and eth reasons of ethical veganism, um, these people are being um, denied. And this is also someone point out, especially problematic, because a lot of vegans are in prison <laughs> for violating the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, <laughs> or. Um, uh, ag ed laws even maybe. Um, so there are a lot of people who are in prison and request a vegan diet for uh, a purely ethical reasons. So this is, I think, um, you know, something that they might consider using instead of relying just on beliefs and ethical veganism to make their case that they require a vegan diet. The, the, the problem, of course, is that they should be getting the diet, a vegan diet, just on ethical grounds, if in fact the law would be, would be followed. And since there's no actual list of religions anywhere, if, if, it's, if we're back to how political this is, I mean, what's going to actually be the lever that actually makes the difference if you say if it's shown that and it's a religion too? I mean, that's a pretty good question. All right, let's take another question from within the room, and then we will um, go back 
Yes. Yes, please. I think I'll also going to bring the microphone. Yes, we'll kind of knock into you. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I didn't know if you were seeing any. I was. Okay. You have neither a legal background nor a microphone. microphone. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, um, all of you. Um, so I don't have a legal background, so this might be a very obvious question and answer to most of you. Um, I'm wondering if, so you sort of mentioned, Cheryl, a parallel between um, the evolution, for lack of a better word, of animal rights to human rights. And I've read about this in other contexts, too. Were there any um, cases or situations, or are there today, where um, people who um, object to equal human rights, say, of indigenous people, black Americans, women, or um, you know, physically handicapped people were considered expressions of religious belief that we might, you know, we might consider them to be hateful and evil, but religious beliefs nonetheless. And if there were such cases, what happened? Or what is happening? And, and if not, how, what's the difference? Why doesn't that arise? Uh, so I should also say, I don't have a background. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't have a legal background either. <laughs> so I'm not like um, familiar about every single case. So actually, in the well, I think the, the polygamy case is the perfect example of not everything you claim to be religious is going to be uh, permissible. Yeah, the Reynolds case, where polygamy is not acceptable, not legal, even though it's religious. I mean, and, and I know a number of like, uh, claims have been denied on the grounds that they, the belief system isn't comprehensive, especially if it's sort of... So, so just two things. One is the Reynolds case, I think most people now think was wrongly decided, interestingly. There is this animal sacrifice case oh, yeah. in Florida, which mm -hmm. would be which is essentially a unanimous Supreme Court decision basically saying that there could be an animal sacrifice in religious expression. There's an empirical study fairly recently that you know kind of looks at what happens in administrative decisions and so on, where almost all requests for religious exemptions are in fact granted. You, even though you wouldn't necessarily think that's the case given the current status of the law, it should be the case given the current status of the law. All right. I, 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 I confused Shoshanka. <laughs> All right. Yes, Thank you here, so please. much for this talk, Dr. Zossi. I have a question that goes back to this idea of context rather than you know, the, the argument itself of whether the philosophy of animal rights counts as religion. So like it's contextual implications. And, and one thing I'm thinking about is just the way that in a contemporary moment, the entanglement of religion and animal protectionism is pretty violent. Like thinking about the rise of cow protectionism in India and its connections with Hindutva, the lynchings that have resulted from that. Um, it, there seems to me to be a kind of politics that you can't separate out necessarily from the claim of religiosity as the grounds for a particular civil rights. So I just wonder if we could reflect more on that. Would you like to, or would you like to take another question? Um, so if you could summarize like what what is your what, what is the exact question? So when we're talking about the plausibility of animal rights philosophy as a religion, I think there's a political implication to it. When when discussing this in this context, like what do you see besides potential instrumentalization in court cases, the, the sort of fallout from that, particularly given the context of religion and violence around animal rights that we're in? So uh, with the philosophy of animal rights, it's definitely a theory of nonviolence. Um, and Reagan is very clear about that. Uh, so um, if people are acting violently, um, in response, or and, and to try to justify their behavior, uh, Reagan's view, or, or justify their behavior by appealing to Reagan's view, then it seems like they misunderstood uh, what the thing actually says. So I think it's really important that uh, we educate people about what the philosophy of animal rights actually um, says and, and says about like what we can and cannot do in in uh, in fulfilling this duty to assist victims of injustice. So I think there's a larger question that's being asked that's connected to Johnny's question too, which is it's an unfortunate fact that committed animal protection movements have often been associated in India 
and arguably in other places as well. It's extremely, in the case of India, nationalistic movements that are quite oppressive to, to other minorities. And it's a little like the animal rights movements equivalent of the fact that a lot of early environmentalists you know, were racist and, 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 and all of that. And I think if I had the question where you're sort of wondering about whether embracing religion also involves whether you want to or not, embracing some of that cultural legacy. All right, oh, do you have another question from online, or do you want to give us yours? We have mostly statements online, so I'll just give a question. Okay. Or we have a question. <laughs> I'll put it. All right, we'll come back to you, Alec. Can you save your chat so I can read it? so much and um, I really appreciate uh, both of your comments and I guess I do share a certain concern about the use of re the, the extension of the religion argument just because of the other ways that religion is being instrumentalized today which I think we all know about so I'm worried about that too. I just wanted actually to respond to one aspect of what Dale said at the end about, uh, well, we don't really, the animal rights movement doesn't really need religion because there's always the self, you can go according to the self-interest argument. And I just wanted to just raise the concern that I'm not sure that we can really depend on human um, um, you know, cognizance of what is in our self-interest. Uh, it's a question, you know, when I see the steak in front of me and I'm really hungry and you're taking it away, you know, what is in my self-interest? Not to mention our inability to, uh, you know, worry about the effects of our actions on climate change. That's really down down the pike. So I wouldn't trust, you know, a rational um, uh, assessment of self-interest. And you know, it it does suggest there there does need to be some kind of moral education and cultivation, whether you want to call that religion or not. Uh, but anyway, it's a very very difficult problem. As, as you know. All right, do you want to jump to down here? We'll wrap up in just a minute. We'll get Ella's questions here. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, well, thank you both again. Um, my question was I know there was um, mention of uh, taking a religious route with animal ethics could potentially pose like a barrier of entry in terms of like maybe um, policy advancements. So do you see this being a particular problem in the courts with uh, gag laws? Um, like, how do you see it being a problem, I guess? Or when it comes to like, defending whistleblowers who have violated the Terrorism Act, how do you think that um, maybe, t again, taking that religious route could hinder policy? Right, so you mentioned the uh, case that involved animal sacrifice in Florida. Um, so that's an interesting case because, um, so there's a, my understanding is a church sort of moved into a city in Florida and the church uh, is known to practice animal sacrifice. So then uh, the city that council or whatnot uh, got together and crafted a law saying that um, killing animals for for purposes of sacrifice, I believe. For non-food For non-food purposes, but then there are all these exemptions, right? But if you're killing pests, that's okay. Uh, so, so the court ruled that uh, that law is unconstitutional because it applied to uh, only conduct motivated by uh, belief in, uh, or religious belief, I should say. Um, they ruled that the, the, uh, ta the town council uh, had as the object of suppression of religion, um, and that wasn't narrowly ta tailored the law. Uh, so I think actually we might be able to use that <laughs> ruling to show why ad gag laws are unconstitutional because they uh, are not neutral or, or generally applicable laws. They apply only to conduct motivated by belief in animal rights. Uh, it seems like they have as their uh, uh, um, their, their object to suppress the speech and beliefs, or, or and we might say like the exercise of beliefs of um, people who adhere to the philosophy of animal rights. Um, so I think that uh, for any reason I mentioned, I think 
using this approach to respond to ad gag laws um, is a big benefit of my approach. And also other kinds of laws that seem to directly uh, target animal rights activists, like the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, like the light bulb um, laws as well, the agricultural disparagement laws. Okay. Okay, last, let's get into your question, Ella, and then we'll need to stop. Your own question. So some people wanted thoughts on the comments, so okay. I'll just ask. Do you, want, do you want to just read a couple of them and, and then ask your question and we'll sort of go from, wrap it up like that. Absolutely. Okay, so one comment was, perhaps characterizing veganism legally as a freedom of conscience instead of a religious liberty for individuals would work better in the legal sense, i.e. offer protection in a workplace situation, etc., and this change in wording classification may help animals stuck in a perpetual state of confinement. Another one was, classifying veganism as a religion seems more problematic than anything. The argument that we should classify it as a religion for people who are in prison isn't focusing on the animal, but yet again, the humans involved. And then uh, another one is, the question of how far this stretches is important, along with the implications in other countries. It would exclude anyone devoted to another religion. Fundamentalist Christians wouldn't even consider it if it was deemed a religion. So I think that comment is interesting because my question kind of has to do, do with that. Um, so we see the sort of decrease in religion, the Pew Research study showing that Americans are less religious now um, than 50 years prior. And so my question is, there's a correlation between secular, secularism, education, and a sort of decrease in practicing religion. And so my concern is, and it goes to your question about um, religiosity and whether it's good for the animals. If we're ostracizing, say, low-income people, um, people who, or people who are not um, in the sort of, um, uh, what is it, educated sort of class um, in America, um, how do we go about getting their buy-in when it comes to this movement when they may feel ostracized because they might feel personally um, attacked or, or their identities implicated as a result of saying that veganism might be considered a religion. Because it has all of the marks, like you said. I even saw the picture of Reagan, um, who was uh, an activist that was killed in Toronto, I yes. believe, or Canada. Um, and so, you know, it has the martyrs, the ethical aspects, all of that. Um, so I would just love your thoughts on how we go about making sure that they don't feel ostracized and we get their buy-in because often they are the ones being impacted by these factory farms and being exploited. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Right, so again, I just want to emphasize that I'm not um, advocating that we go around in public discourse calling the philosophy of animal rights a religion. I think that it's prudent to uh, only use that categorization when we're, um, when we're maybe perhaps going to court and maybe if we've exhausted all other uh, uh, legal legal tactics, you might say. Um, another thing that I was thinking about is we might, and maybe I'll do this as I develop the project, is draw a distinction between like the religion of animal rights and then the philosophy of animal rights, where it might be the case where you can accept the philosophy of animal rights without the religious aspect. So if you think about something like Catholicism and its connection to natural law theory, right? Uh, natural law theory is one of the main uh, moral theories behind Catholicism in addition to like, um, uh, right. But you don't need to be a Catholic to subscribe to uh, natural law theory. So maybe it might be the case that we should draw a distinction between like the, the theory animal rights theory and then the religion and then emphasize um, if it starts to be, if, if you know people start categorizing animal rights as a religion, you could maybe draw this distinction to where you might have the theory that underlies the religion, but you need not subscribe to the religion in order to adhere to the theory. Okay, thank you. Dale, did you have something to end with? Yeah, just maybe this. That, oh, sorry. I think what your question brings out is that we're, we're actually, I mean, th this is all kind of a mess because, because essentially there's this category of conscientious action and sincere belief, um, which is what, is, so religion in much of the law, not all of the law, has come to mean something like that. 
but we can't talk about it that way. You know, we have to put everything in this religion box and call this a religion, even though it doesn't have many of the traditional associations with religion. I mean, I sort of remind you of a paper that Ronnie Dworkin wrote many years ago called "I'm Not Punishing Civil Disobedience," and the argument today would be seen as a religious argument. I mean, he's saying you shouldn't punish civil disobedience under certain conditions because it's the sincere expressions of beliefs, basically. Now we would call that religion. So I think we, have, I think there's just a real problem here into trying to cram all that in the religious box. And the last thing I would say is, is just, I, I really think Cheryl's really onto something about something like the uh, Animal uh, Enterprise Terrorism Act and so on, and, and the, you, using these kinds of arguments as narrow legal arguments. The problem is what used to be a narrow legal argument pops up in people's news feeds today, right? And, 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 and so you can't really sort of insulate these discourses in the way that you once did. Fox News takes, oh, veganism is now a pagan religion, and these guys got thrown for that reason. And it's got, you know, many, many hits, so. And then maybe like one thing we need to is just for education of what is meant by religion under the law and uh, sort of the fundamental reason why there are these uh, religious protections to begin with. Well, I think just to, to wrap up, I mean, I think one conclusion might be that the American legal system does not have sufficient nuance to accommodate deeply held beliefs, ethical beliefs, uh, ethical actions. And as a result, you kind of have to stuff it all in the category of religion. <laughs> and Cheryl's made us a case that one can do that, but whether that's beneficial on a narrow legal frame or in a more wider social frame, I think are open, provocative questions uh, that we are grateful you've, you've raised, raised for us. So I want to thank you both very much. <laughs>